Chapter 7, The Quest for the Frozen Potato He come marched out of Old Wrinkly's house back to the celebrations in the harbor, followed by a grumbling toothless. For about 600 meters, he was absolutely certain about what he was going to do. He would go and explain to his father what had happened and ask him to set up a quest for the frozen potato. The hooligans were always going on quest, but when he eventually found his father, who was trying his luck in the frozen lucky dip, he suddenly didn't feel quite so sure of himself. Stoic wasn't as pleased to see his only son as he normally was. He had just lost a big bet because the bog burger young heroes had whipped the hooligan young heroes in the smash sticks on ice competition 14 goals on nil. So Stoic was not in the best of moods. Bothered that old wrinkly was his stupid sustain as easy win for the hooligans. He said, put all your money on it. He said, and what happens? The bog burgers win for it? Nil. No. I should have known it. Stoic muttered him to himself as he drew a large frozen object from the lucky deep and tried to work out what it was for. What it was. Fish, a useful axe, a small chair. Father, said he caused dirt terminally. I want to set out on a quest. Stoic looked at his son with surprise. What sort of quest? You remember my friend Fishlex? Sam Hiccup. Stoic rubbed his nose crossly and grunted. Old Wrinkly says the reason he attacked you was because he has been stung by the venomous vampire and he is in the first stage of vampiritis, and that causes explosives for madness, you know. And the thing is, f father, unless we can find the antidote in time, Old Wrinkly says fish legs may die. Stoic looked as if he wasn't sure whether to be sad or happy, but then he saw his son's face and heartily looked sad. Um, yes, oh dear, said Stoic. So, I want to set out on a quest for the antidote. And I'll say, what is the ant antidote? Antidote, as Stoic the vest. Old Wrinkly says the antidote is the potato. So he got, shh, said Stoic, you're not supposed to say you're not supposed to name it and the vegetable that no one dares name is an imaginary vegetable surely you know that hiccup old wrinkly says that his tricks went to america and brought back a frozen potato continued hiccup stumbling so i want to find the potato and save fish -like's life i forbid you do you to the uh, any such thing real story if we don't believe in the potato fish legs made in the potato, fish legs may die, he cut out right back at his father. Stoic and Vest lost his temper and waved the undignified frozen object UFO around his head. He rolled roared at his son so loudly, poor he cause ear rang. Your friend Fishlex is a little weirdo who just called me a jelly bellied lady bumped gridicus greedy guts. He got flinched as if he had been struck and then Stoic felt ashamed and controlled himself. He re reached out and patted his son on the shoulder and he tried to speak more reasonably. Look, son, I know this is difficult for you because you are fond of your friend, but let's just say that for once in a blue moon, Old Wrinkly is right. Even then, as the chaff, I will not r risk the life of my only son for the sake of a little weirdo that Fat has got in it in for. Isn't the chaff's job to do that? So he got stepped steadily. Fishlex has no one else to look after him. You will not do it, says Stoic very meaningfully in it, because I forbid it. And that is an order, son. An order from your chaff. 
Stoic put the UFO on his head and had decided that it was a helmet and that stalked off. The uniform thing about going on a quest to save the life of your sick, ba- sick best friend is that you have no best friend to go with you. He could watch his father stalking off with what looked very like a frozen chair on his head and wonder miserably what his chances were if he ran on the quest for the frozen pudding that alone. Not impossible, he thought, suddenly, but let's face it, it's improbable. Kamikaze stuck her head out from underneath the lucky deep table. Did I hear someone mention the word quest? When do we get started? Oh, Kamikaze, you really should listen in on other people's conversations. So he got Kamikaze wiggled out from underneath the table. Mm, Chap, why have you got a chair on your head? And started doing handstands. She still had her ice skates on. As Spock burgers always listen in on other people's conversation, she said cheerfully, It's one of the reasons I'm going to be so helpful to you on the quest for the frozen potato. You are not going on the quest for the frozen potato, said Kika. It's far too dangerous. Dangerous? Pah! But both said Kamikaze. Why? I burnt whole flocks of sheep off the Wizatox. I've stolen the helmet right off the head of my gods, the murderers, and you want me to steal one measly little vegetable? No problem, Hika. Watch and learn, my boy. Watch and learn. Hika raised his eyes to the heavens. If Kamikaze had a fault, it was like she was very, very pleased with herself. But it had to be admitted, she was an excellent burger. There's this bad man with an axe, he got pointed out. Better, better and better, said Kamikaze. There's nothing I enjoy more than testing my man with axes. It's my favorite sport. If you don't let me join in, I'll tell your big fat crow's father where you're going. But the split melon person hiccup, you see, Green Kamikaze, we bug girls have no nervous at all. It's very useful to us. Hika gave up and said she could come if she wanted to. Kamikaze rushed off to get her burglary equipment and Hika prepared a small sled to take them to Hysteria. He also pulled down his boot, the hoof of Puffin, to darn on runners behind the sleigh. What are you doing? asked Kamikaze returning with her arms laden with ropes and only shaped pointy metal objects. It's getting so near up to springtime. The ice may start cracking when we're out there. And if it does, we're going to need some way to get him up, getting back across the Solon Sea, replied Hickok, trying not to think about what would happen if the ice really did melt. That might mean they had to face the Doomfang on top of their other problems. Hickok went off to look for one eye and... Explain his problem and the big rifle laughed snarling. Look, revolting little human boy, I don't know why you think I might ha- want to help you. I can- I am not your mind. I hate humans. One thing I'll absolutely swear to you. I'll never repeat ev- never waste a tear crying over the death of one of you human. No brainers. Ah, oh, said he calmly, but the antidote isn't just going to save the life of my friends. Fish, friend Fishlight, is it? The perfect thing dragons as well as humans. Thousands of dragons die of vorpentitis every year. When I bring back the frozen potato, I shall plant potatoes all over brick, and no dragon shall die for Profess ever again. Well, that got one eye, of course, because his heart had turned off humans, was only matched by his love for his fellow dragons, 
and five minutes later, Hika was hitching at the big severed tooth dragon up on his sleigh. Hika told Stoic on the way that he was going to spend the night at the Snowcloud's house, and Stoic was delighted. Excellent, my boys, world Stoic. So, you've decided to take my advance and find yourself a better friend. Well done, Hika. So now, said Hika, sitting down in the sleigh next to Kamikaze, we can nip to Hysteria, steal the potato, and get it to fish legs we saw my father, even knowing we've gone. Only Snow noticed the small sleigh dragging a boat, sneaking out of Ligan Harbor on its way to Hysteria on the quest of for the frozen potato. Sunla hoped that wherever Hika was going, it was somewhere dangerous and that he would never come back. Chapter 8 The Wars of Sor One eye pulled the sleigh across the ice at a crazy speed. Once or twice, Hika tongued on his reins to try and get came to slow down but the big driver ignored him and so in the end he gave up trying the quicker we get to hysteria the better anyway he reminded himself the burningly cold wind slammed into his face tearing at his eyelids as they car- carried across the ice the hopeless puffin bounced crazily behind them like an ugly duckling Desperately trying to keep up with its demonated mother. Luckily, although she was not an attractive looking boat, she was sturdy and used to the old Connaught or two. Hiccup had brought long snacks for everybody that were supposed to last the whole journey, but to sleep finished all of them in the first. Three minutes littering the sleigh with crumbles, crumbs, chicken bones, and wrinkled shells. Too slice cold, he wailed. Too slice hungry. Too slice bored. Oh, oh, oh. Kamikaze sitting on my tail. Are we nearly there yet? We only left five minutes ago, is Klehika. So let's play I spy, said Tusas firmly. At first, Kamikaze was horribly cheerful, chatting constantly and singing loudly, her ba- bright blue eyes prickling with excitement. But as the long hours were on, she and she played their 50-second game of I Spy with Hika, translating for two slides, and as the sky turned pink, and gray is the coming of the evening, and as they passed the mazy midlots of their left and began to hear the first moments of the doom thing under the eyes, if a cavalcassi fell silent. He cup made one eye wait for the evening to grow darker before they turned the corner up into the worst of sore, so the hysteric looks out wouldn't spot them coming. For a tense, Stomach trembling, half hour they waited until he could judge it was safe and gave a pull on the ice rain to get him going again. The gigantic sea cliffs of villainy and hysteria loomed above them scarily in the darkness. One eye bounced into the worst of sorrow, and the cliffs leaped up on either side of the little sleigh as it raced along. Like dizzyingly high prison walls, the eyes of dragons shine in the dark, and so one eye's great eye act as a searchlight, showing them the way. The eyes in the narrow gorge was so clear that it was almost transparent, and in the beam of one eye's eye, you you could see right through it as if it were a two meter thick pane of forced glass down into the sea below. How interesting, said Hiccup, as he looked over the edge of the sleigh. I can even make out a show of marketing down here, down there. The mass of tiny fish went on forever, swimming slowly in their millions way down below them, until suddenly they scrapped. 
shooting away like tiny sparks in an explosion as a great dark shape infinitely large suddenly appeared under the ice. It was the gar gargantian shadow of a dragon the size of an underwater mountain and it easily came up with the speedy little sleigh, its long tail lazily powering it along, its wings nearly brushing the edges of the walls of sore as it beat them slowly to swim underneath. Is that the, the doom fang whispered to Slash into Hiccup's ear. Let's go home. Hiccup gazed downwards in fascinated horror as the great dragon turned its head to one side and Hiccup found himself staring into an enormous bloodshot green de dragon eye as long as the sleigh itself. It was as if all the grain in the world of peas, of grass, of spinach, of leaves, of beans and frogs had been concentrated in that one eye and given in interestingly of a pure green action. exit. It was like looking through into the sun and midday through a great green microscope and Hiccup was so dazzled he nearly fell off the sleigh until he was brought back to his sense of by a treble sight, and the eyes below them jumped up like an earthquake. The sleigh jumped too and one eye soared brightly into the air with a complaining yell. Sat when the eyes again as the doom thing butted his head against the sick of transparent wall. With terrified relief, Hika realized the eyes were so deep that it was holding strong, although it was now shut through with tiny little white cracks. The sleigh raced towards the entrance to his terrier harbor like a mouse striking towards a mushroom. The dragon followed sobbing, sodding the eyes underneath as they went, with terrible blows from its battering ram head. When one eye turned into the harbor, he was going so fast the moment momentum from the boat behind almost turned them round in a great screeching circle. The slave balanced wildly on one runner before sliding back down the and carry on. He could look over his shoulder. The doom fang was too large to fit through the narrow harbor entrance. It pushed its great head through the Hikaku Sea uh, through and Hikaku Sea, so though not here, its huge mouth opening in a roar of rage, its paw with a terrible talons tear tearing at the water. It blew out a great gush of underwater blue flame that shot out underneath and speeding sleigh and straight forward in a straight line right up to the shoreline, almost as if it were a bright blue road telling them where to go. He's not praise green kamikaze as the sleigh raced along the bright blue road. That is one doom thing in a very bad mood. Let's hope the ice holds long enough for us to steal the potato and get out of here, Shiver Hika. That creature will kill us with one snap of its jaws. When one eye finally came to a pungling, punging halt at the ice edge of Hika's clamber out of the slit, his legs wobbling like a jellyfish, the evening had become become night. The bright blue road had turned a palace turquoise and was gradually fading entirely. The harbor sink sore was entirely distracted. Oh, sorry, deserted. Pulled up onto the rocks, half buried in show in the snow, where hundreds of historical boats, even in their snow-covered state, you could tell this were God's ship. Ghost ships that hadn't rocked on salt water for 15 years. Rags and of sails hung from drooping mats. Oars and rudders jutting 
from the snow were rotting or snapped in half. He consented to slash off to have a look at the hysterical, hysterical village, and the little dragon reluctantly fled off into the darkness. Why does t- Tuslas always have to do this, complete Tuslas, because you're the one with wings, Tuslas, he kept explained for the emptiness time, unhitching one eye. Kamakasi unpacked her burly equipment, humming happily, shoving interesting looking pointy instruments into her pockets, putting on her special shoes with spikes on the shoes. So winding lines of the lengths of spa stout rope around her middle. Hiccup's usual comp- companion on adventures was Fishlegs, who was always terrified and asking what on earth they were doing in yet another life starting disaster. So it was quite a change to have Kevin and Cassie treating the whole thing as if it were an enjoyable outing. They put on their skates and waited for Tuslas to return from his trip to find out the whereabouts of the historical village. The, he gave them a shout when he fled out from nowhere and landed on Hiccup's shoulder. It's as scary out there, pointed Tuslas, his eyes glowing luminously, luminously in the darkness. Dumb historics is having a b- b- banquet for Fraza's Stay if looking squirmy. He can explain what Tuslas had said to Kamikaze and she got up. Excellent, she said. Hopefully, they'll be so distracted they won't notice us. Let's get going. The little party set off up the cliff paths, one eye pulling them, his one eye burning right in the darkness. Chapter 9 Back on Burke. Back on Burg, Fishlegs was hot as fire, weak as a fly caught in a spider's web, and talking nonsense. Old Wrinkly quietly bathed his head with cool water and tried to feed him some watery tea. Stop it, you wizard old dried up crab claw, feathered Fishlegs feebly, trying to twist away from the old man's hand, but hardly strong enough to move. They must get here before ten in the morning, muttered old Wrinkly to himself. He's dying fast. Don't worry, whispered Fishlegs, looking straight into old Wrinkly's concert old eyes. Hiccup will make it. Hiccup always makes it. Sir only knows how. And then he drifted to off into nonsense again. Out in the middle of the sullen sea, strange noise- noises could be heard like the cracking of an old man's knee or an or the wrapping of a jagged in cockle on the door. The ice was beginning to crack. Chapter ten Ferris stay Eve on hysteria. When they reached the top of the cliff, the ground kept on rising up to Mount Hysteria, on which was perched the shadowy outline of the hysterical village all in darkness. One eye dragged them right up to the bottom of the village walls, where Kamikaze got out her ropes. She threw up the rope with the metal hook attached it, and one and on the first a- attempt, it caught hold of the top of the wooden wall. She screamed up it like a little blonde monkey and disappeared over the top. One eye spread wide his wings and flew after her. Hiccup took a deep breath, grabbed hold of the rope, and climbed up, trying to ignore the skulls grinning at him from the top of the bubble mats. They were the only visitors to the historical village in 15 years. The village seemed at first to be distorted. There was no one in the streets, no light in the windows. But the great hall was blazing with light. Smoke below the out of several chimneys, music and chatter laughing poured out of the windows. Really, beside the great hall, lying on great tree trunks, there stood the largest Viking ship he had ever seen. It did seem a trifle strange 
to keep a ship so far from the sea, but he could suppose the historians hadn't been doing any sailing at all for the last fifteen years, so perhaps the center of town was a good place to keep a boat as any, and what a ship it was. It was more the death and planks of a Roman galleon, and it was the only Viking longboat he cup had ever seen with not one but three masts, and its paw its pro the figure hand dragon was a snaring monstrous nightmare, and he cup heart he cups her bit a bit a little faster with excitement as he read the name painted on the side of the big flowing letters, the America Dream. Perhaps the sordid old wrinkly told him really was true. In star in contest of the ship, he could have seen in the harbor this boat was a tip-top condition. The rest of the village was two meters deep in snow, but the America Dream was spotless, her decks entirely snow-free. She was freshly pan painted, the hysterical flag flew truly from her center mast, and her oars were all out, just as if she were about to set sail of distant shores at a moment's notice. We'll climb up on the roof of the great hall and see if we can overhear what's going on, whispered Kamikaze. Kamikaze didn't even bother to use a rope that this time. She just shined up the shell wall, wall appearing to cling to it with invisible suction like a frog. Once she reached the roof, she let down a rope for hiccup, and one eye hauled him up with it. The roof was tied side deep in snow, and he had to crawl through it, following the paths made by Kamikaze. She wriggled through to the central chimney, which had no smoke coming out of it, and she had he, she and he could peer down into the room below. A blast of heat so strong he could have to close his eyes, poured out of the chimney. Hiccup's hands burned as they had they began to warm up. Eventually his watering eyes adjusted to the heat and the light. Down below the hysterics were enjoying a truly magnif magnificent banquet. The long center table was loaded high with fish, fresh flesh and full, cooked in every possible manner, whole stages, entire peaks, and brimming cups of a beer and wine. A big drunken chap was dancing a jig on the table at one end, and the hysterics were laughing, and threw bits of food and chairs legs at him. Fires blazed in six huge fireplaces. Enormous white rush made out of the skin of Polar bears were strewn about the floor. Hanging on the walls were the hands of dragons of every possible size, color, and description, and also the heads of a couple of animals Hiccup had never seen before. One that looked like an enormous depressed deer, and another that resembled a gigantic bull with black curly hair. A map of a barbaric world drawn, drawn on deer skin was hanging in a grey curtain against the north wall. On the west of the map, someone had scribbled out uh, the grey sobbling waterfall, which on most Viking maps were marked end of the world, and replaced it with a crude char charcoal drawing of an island, island called America. With a sinking of the heart, he could recognize a big blonde beard, bearded bloke sitting on a stone of the chaff, Norbert the Nutjob. It was definitely the big brute who he could had shot with an arrow in the bottom of the day before. His throne had a couple of plops plump cousin cushions on it, but he was shifting from back bed top to bed top as if in some pain. In one hand he held a very unusual, enormous double headed axe. The axe was 
different. In that one, blade was a bright and shiny copper gold, but the other blade was rusted and blackened and deeply scarred. There was no sign of the potato. Suddenly, Hika felt a bit foolish. He had somehow expected it to be displayed somewhere obvious, perfectly with a big side underneath it, labouring it clearly as the potato. Because of course he didn't, he did not have any idea what a potato looked like, whether it was orange or green or large or small. He kept his summer imagined it as red with little black spots and kind of a blunt and triangular just because it sounded so tight. Purple, perhaps? Really? He had a clue. Okay, whispered Kamikaze. I'm going to have to go down there to try and find out where they keep the potato. It could be absolutely anywhere. The unwound she unwound one of the ropes from round her waist, and he kept suggested that there should be there should tie it around one eye slack. That way, if you get intended trouble, you can yank on it three times, and one eye can hold you up sharpish. One eye objected strongly to have anything tied around his leg and only agreed when Hika reminded him when a hero was going to be in the dragon world when they returned to Beric with an antidote to Vorpentitis. The little girl then lowered herself down through the hole in the roof. It was completely dark and very quiet on top of the great hole. Waiting by the hole, Hika felt rather like he had as a small boy going ice fishing with his father when Stoic cut a hole in the ice and let down the line and then all there was to do was wait and wait and wait. Susan scratched behind his ears, one eye peeked at his teeth, and he got shivered with anxiety. Hurry up, Kamikaze! At the moment, at any moment, he got expected a great crack to appear in the huge flood expanse of frozen sea, and then they would never get home, and fish legs would be lost. Or perhaps Kamikaze had got into trouble down there. He got peered down through the hole. Kamikaze was clinging to a rope like a spider two meters below them. He kept slant down a little farther to try and see what was happening. And then, to his absolute horror, the edge of the chimney already bunkling under the weight of the snow have way beneath him and with a shirt, he got fell into the hole. Chapter 11 In the so Kamikaze watched with round, scared eyes as Hika fell past her, almost falling windily. In ordinary great constants, what that would have been the end of Hika, for the great hole was full of twenty meters high, and he should have broken his neck, falling all the way from the very top. But in a series of tremendous strokes of luck, the traditional Freya's day if dish was onion soup, and on hysteria it was served in a truly gigantic cauldron with two meters wide and a meter 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 deep. This pot was sitting on the table directly below the falling hiccup, and he plunged straight into it, bottom first. If the soup had been any hotter, Hika would have been burned on, burned to death, but it had been on the table for some time and had cooled to a pleasant swimming temperature. If the hysterics had been any fonder of onion soup, it would not have been deep enough to break Hika's fall, but the hysterics only served onion soup because it was a traditional thing to do and had hardly touched it. So he got merrily bumped his bottom gently on the bottom of the cauldron and rose to the surface, coughing and spluttering, his, fu- his hair full of onions. There was a shock silence. Nothing puts a quicker stop uh, to a jolly meal than a stranger and a great deal of snow suddenly falling onto a 
on to the banqueting table. The hysterics sat, sat amidst spitting snow out of their beards, staring at the unexpected visitor gasping in their soap. Soup. Nobar and Nadja was the first to recover, shaking the snow off the off and leaping to his feet. A sun sinks. He screamed, seize them. Twenty warriors sprang on to the table. Hiccup tried to swim out of trouble, but the backstroke couldn't make up for the fact that he was entirely surrounded. Two large hysterics dragged him out of the soup and dropped him, gripping the gloopy in front of Norbert and Nadja. Are there more of you? barked Norbert and Norbert and Nadja, brandishing the blackened blade of his axe in front of Hiccup's face. Hiccup shook his head, spraying soup in all directions. Norbert did not jump and his warriors peered upwards. Kamikaze was hanging way up in the darkness of the ceiling and her black coat clothes came in handy for they couldn't see her search the roof and the village screamed norbert did not jump he turned to face hiccup again norbert did not jump had a tick in his left eye and it was jerking around frankly like a fly doing a jig I'm sure I recognize you, he said, using the edge of a nearby warrior's cloak to wipe the soap, soap off Hiccup's face. Great tumbles of sir, it's the revolting hooligan war who shot an arrow in my royal button yesterday. This wasn't a very good start. How do you do, gulped Hiccup politely. I do not very well, screamed Norbert, the notcher. My bottoms are burning. The warriors came panting back into the hall and said they searched both of the room and the village and there were no more ascensions to be found. One eye and two slats must have fled off to hide in the darkness. Norbert and Nadja look rather cross. You're a very small assassin, assassin he said, fluffily removing his cuff sword and fluffing, stuffing it in his old sword belt. And so, come to think of it, was the one who attacked us with you yesterday. The one who sicked like a grandmother with knee trouble. I know I've been out of the loop for the last 15 years, but do the hooligans really think they can astand me with children? I'm not an ass assassin. Killed Hikai Kovalny. Liar! Screeched Norbert the Nutjob and lurched toward as if to kill Hikai with the axe right again, right again, and settled himself back to back on his sword with a wise. So, if you are not an assassin, small Norbert, what are you doing here on Hysteria shooting me with arrows and poisoning my soup? I'm looking, said he got for the potato. There was an astonished silence. Shh, said Norbert the Nacha, looking over his shoulder and as if wolves had ears. You're not supposed to name the vegetable that no one dares name. Of course, said he got carefully, carefully. Now that I'm here, I realize that it was all just fairy stories. There's no such thing as a potato, is there? Because there's no such place as America. The earth is as flat as a pancake, and if you sail to the west, west, eventually you just fall off the end of it. Rubbish! She ignored the nut job. Kill him! He screamed, his eyes bulging, his mouth formling. Before, with an enormous effort, he gained control of himself again. No, educate him, then kill him said Norbert the Nadja, twiddling his fancy mustaches to score himself. The earth is round as a circle, and a circle has no end, explained Norbert carefully. There is such a thing as America, I know because I've been there. And as for the vegetable that no one dares name, I don't know what you're talking about. 
That's because there's no such thing, replied Hika. There is such a thing, insisted Norbert, trying to keep his temper. Isn't, said Hika. Is, isn't, is, isn't, is, 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 is yelled Norbert the nutshell, twiddling his fancy mustache. Since so hard they got all tangled in the knot. Proof there is. Challenge Hika. I know there's no such a thing as a vegetable that no one dares need, because the vegetable no one dares need is right here in this room, cried Norbert the Nutjaw. He ran over to the wall where the map of America was hanging. With two grand sweeps of the axe, he threw aside the curtain. Very small assassin, announced Norbert the Nutjaw proudly. Say hello to Papa. Oh, whoops, breezed Hika. Norbert the Dutcher was clearly madder than a mad march. He had her having a nervous breakdown. For there, on the stand, larger than life, stood what looked like probably horribly like the frozen body of Norbert the Dutcher's papa. He was standing br- proud and upright. You ever whisker froze a solid, mouth open in a soundless yell, a scary motionless sight. One hand was on his hip, and if the other had other he held a casket was glass sides filled with ice. On the top of the ice sat the round, rather disappointing shape of lumpy brownish vegetable. Surely that can be the magical one. Dress potato said Pika. Sticking out of the vegetable was a single arrow. Dora's papa was surrounded by a carpet of unusual dragon creatures called Squares Burger Alarm System. They have no legs to chase after their prey, so they lie on their backs, waving their extra long nails gently in the air. Any animal that comes into contact with those nails causes the whole pack of scolders to scream unbearably loudly. The sound is so personally noisy that it actually kills smaller dragons who have much better hearing than humans, stone that on the spot. The squealers then devour their victim, and rather like p- piranha fish, they can strip an animal to the bone in 60 seconds flat. But Norbert, guess Hiccup, I saw your father was supposed to be dead. Oh, he's dead, all right, swelled Norbert. He's as dead as a doornail. But as I was keeping the potato frozen anyway, I saw I freeze Peppa too. You sh- could give your father a proper Viking funeral," said Sutter Hickam. He looks untidy standing there, and a bit spooky. My father has his furniture on the day the Doomfang dies," shouted Norbert the Nutjob. That's why I froze him. Just before my father breathed his last, he stuck into the potato the only arrow he had left given to him by the father. Feather people and made me promise to use this to get rid of the doom fang. That's impossible, objected Hiccup. You can't kill a doom fang, great creature like a doom fang, with one tidy little arrow. Not impossible, weird little red haired boy, corrected Norbert the Nutshell. Just improbable, and made more improbable by the fact that we can't get. The arrow out of the vegetable that no one dares name. Take a look at this inscription on the cask. Casket. Take a look at the casket Big Job was holding. In it, frozen by the ice, was the disappointingly boring vegetable called a potato. The star and stuck and stuck in this potato was the golden little arrow. De- decorated with brilliant feathers taken from birds Hika would not have recognized. American birds that once flew about in undiscovered American skies. On the front of the casket was written in the following script the following inscription. Whoever removes the arrow from the vegetable shell read shall rid us of the doomfang and provide him prove himself right true hero and ruler of all the viking tricks. 
we can get out, cut the air out of the precious vegetable, the normal the nut job salad. We practice all year round with concept arm wrestling, and every year our strongest champions try and pull it out. Even I do not seem to be able to do it, although the first is obviously referring to me. The arrow is stuck in the vegetable, and we are stuck in hysteria until the death of my father is avenged. He can look at the potato. You can't get the arrow out of the potato because it is frozen slowly. If you defrosted the potato, a child could pluck it out. He got suggested. The tick was back in Robert the nut job eye. My dying father gave me this arrow for a reason, snapped Norbert the nut job. It's supposed to be a test to find out who is strong enough to defeat the Nymphic. What would be the point of the test if just anybody could do it? Who are you anyway, you small boy, and how dare you ask me all these questions? Now, I'm very glad you brought that up, Norbert, said Hika seriously. I am Hika Horian's Haddock the Third, only son of Stoic the Vest, and my friend Fishlegs, who you also met yesterday, has had the bad luck of bad luck to have got beaten by a venomous form hurt. That is bad luck, said Norbert the Dutch jumps with satisfaction. Certain deaths, I say. I can't say I'm surprised, you know. He seemed like just the sort of little window that fate would have into it. It in four. Fish legs is not a little window, interrupted Hika. The point is, Norbert, I have been told that his potato of yours is the only antidote to Vormprat Vernum, and I wonder if you could possibly spare it to save my friend's life. It would be the kind of thing you've ever done. Norbert the nut job was fl- was flabbergasted. And what, whispered Norbert the Nacha, you would you do with my papa's precious vegetable after I gave it to you? Well, so he got I guess my friend would eat it. For a second Nor- Norbert the Nacha stared into space. Then he was livid with rage, rolling his double headed axe around his head. It is world over the Dutch. You shoot me in the bottom and then you want to divide up and in my dare that papa's precious America vegetable kill him, kill him, kill him. After a short struggle he calmed down again and turned to Hiccup with great dangly holding up his arms. I could, said Norbert, do not just kill you right now, you evil vegetable murderer, but we histories are not like that. We histories are clavisly said. We never eschewed before we have given a loosely potato surveying criminals as obsolete fair trail. And on his terrier, Norbert the Nutjob gave a nasty mad leer. The trail you face is trail by axe. Oh, crumbs, so he caught Norbert the Nutjob st- strode over to the middle of the room where there was a large tree trunk loop of at the base. Fate herself shall decide your fate, said Norbert the nut job. I shall throw my axe high into the air, and if it lands with the golden side bearing itself into the wood, I shall allow you to life. But if it lands on the dark side, Norbert the nut job stroke the dark side lovely, long, lovingly. If it lands on the dark side, I shall kill you with this very axe on the spot. I hope you will. You're feeling lucky. Norbert stepped back dreamily. He gazed up at the heavens. Come, great powers of fate and destiny, yelled Norbert the nut job. I sure to do as you tell me, life or death. The axe soared towards the ceiling, speeding slowly through the air. It began to fall first the bright side, then the dark.
Hika was not as slow, tough as the other boys, but his eyesight was very good. He could see the axe was going to land in the dark side down, and he leaped it between the dark and bright blades, and cut the axe with its wooden handle just before the dark side landed in the wood. The hysterics gasp. High up on the beam in the ceiling, Kamikaze gasped too. He could have the axe above his head and drove the bright blood deep into the tree trunk. Bright side winds, no matter not jump, shouted Hikaw. Horadan had out the third, his hands on his hips. Nobody knew quite what to do. No matter not jump's mouth opened and shut like a fish out of water. You cheated, screamed No matter not jump. Fate must have let that mean cheat. He got pointed out. Now set me free like you promised. Norbert looked as if he was ex- about to explode. He was used to terrified adults who curled down before him and his terrible acts of fate. He wasn't used to bossy small boys who told him to defer his precious potato and bury his papa and cut his axe before it landed. But what if Hika was right, and fate had really meant to let Hika chip? Norbert did not dare annoy fate herself. Seize him, screamed Norbert. He can't lie, leave, but he can't leave all his days in prison. Dad will teach him to shoot arrows at Norbert the Nutjob. Four, uh, four or five burly Turks grabbed Hiccup and dragged him to a small cage suspended by a single chain from a beam in the rafters of a boat. They pushed him in the lock of Locked the cage, returning the key to Norbert, who put it in his pocket. And then the hysterics forgot about Hiccup and parted long, long into the night, laughing and singing and eating and drinking too much. Hiccup sat suddenly in the small cage, trying to think of cunning pain, plan to get out of this situation. It didn't look too good. Even if he could escape from the locked lock cage, steal the potato, and get away without a single hysteric noticing, he could hear some ominous cracking noises f- coming from the ice outside. Loud crackings and knockings, like the string of an enormous sword upon a stone. The ice was beginning to melt, and once... The Doomfang was free again. There would be no way out of hysteria. As the long night went wore on, one by one, the hysterics fell asleep in the chairs or on the floor or in the case on of one fat warrior on top of the table hugging the remains of a roasted boar. Nor but the nut job slum on his stone, his thumb in his mouth, crediting cradling his drove-headed axe. High up in the ceiling of the great hall, Kamikaze was sleeping, clinging off her beam like a little black cat. Time ticked on and his cubs struggled to keep awake, but eventually the gr- gentle rocking of the cage and the cloudy hid the f- f- heat and fumes of alcohol in the room overpowered him and he too nodded off. Chapter 12 Will Tusla save the day? Meanwhile, up on the roof, Tusla's and one eye had fled off the hidden in the American dream when they heard the noise of Hika falling into the onion soup and the historic warriors charging outside to look for other assassins. When things grew quiet again, they flew back into back to the chimney. Both dragons were cold, hungry, and tired. One eye's eye glimmered golden yellow in the dark darkness. Shall we leave them? One eye mushed to himself. It looks like they haven't found the cure for worm paintings after all, and I'm not hanging around here just to save the skin of the couple of stinking humans. Shelf fish humans, grumbled Ruth Toothless. They never think of poor, cold, hungry Toothless. 
what I snorted. Well, I don't blame them for that. You're just a lap dragon, an overgrown rat, and you shouldn't be hungry anyway. Who ate all the snacks in the sleigh on the way here? I like to know. I'll give them till morning when I decided letting the rope attach to his leg flop down the chimney and into the great hole again and setting himself in the snow to keep on the roof. My aunt Snagaloos died for warm patties and it's a nasty way to go. Tuesday's not sleeping here, moaned Tuesday's altered. It's too cool. Tuesday's that they liked it. Sensed it. He checked whether the big dragon was really asleep. One eye had a deep rumbling shore and Tuesday's carried on. Don't like you, you big white grumsly mountain gorilla. One eye's one eye snapped open and its big served tooth jaws lashed out towards Tuesday's. But they shot on thin air, for Tuesday's had the reflex of a blue bottle, and he had already t- tumbled down through the hole in the roof. Tuesday soared into the great hole over the heads of the sleeping, mumbling hysterics, and landed on top of Hiccup's cage. The cage swung vi- violently to the right and Hiccup's head banged sharply on one of the bars, walking him up. Oh, pressed the Hiccup, looking straight into the upside down, green gauge eyes of his pet dragon. Toothless, he whispered joyfully. Thanks, sir. You're here. You see how right I was to bring you can bring you you can save the day. Ha huh, grunted Toothless crossly. Just flap over to the big frozen viking over there, will you, and nick the potato, and then we'll be off, whispered Hiccup. Tusa looked where Hiccup was pointing to, Nubra's papa big job and the casket, and gave a shriek of terror. Squealers, he gasped and jumped into the cage, burying his face in Hiccup's leg. Oh goodness, yes, I forgot. Squares can kill a dragon as small as you, can't they? Remember he kept suiting the little dragon by storking him on the back. Okay, don't steal the potato, but the key to this cage is in Nora the Nutjob's pocket. And if you could just flap off and get it. But Tuzas has smelled the onion soup on Hiccup's leg, and he gave it a lick. Onion soup, said Tuzas anxiously. You've been eating onion soup. Yes, yes, said Hiccup heartily. I fell in the soup, but about the key. But this was the last throw as far as Tuzas was con- concerned. He was furious, and he swelled up to nearly twice the size with anger, and flew out of the cage like an in the first little balloon. It's not fair, it's not fair, snorted Tuzlas. You've been stuffing yourself with onion soup and poor Tuzlas starving and now you want Tuzlas to face a whole load of squirrels with no food in his tummy? Typical. Well, you can't just wait. That's all. Tuzlas will... Tuzlas have his supper and then maybe he'll help you out. Tuzlas whispered Hiccup as loud as he dared. This is important. Get that key right now or I'll, I'll, you're what? Jerry Tuzlas chickly flapping out of Hiccup's way as he desperately tried to grab Tuzlas tail through the bars of the cage. Sticking out his little pink fork tongue, Tuzlas hopped down on to the bank wedding tables and tucked into the roast buffalo pie, ignoring Hiccup's, ignoring Hiccup's furious, frustrated whispers from the cage, swinging a couple of meters above. Tuzas can't hear, sing Tuzas through a mouthful of pumpkin. God saw something in his air. Ooh, that rhymes. Tuzas can't hear. God saw something in his ear. Tuzas can't hear. God saw something in his ear. And for the next five minutes, Tusa pretended to be quite deaf and took his time hoping from plate to plate, gro- gorging himself to on deep f- fried ma- mackerel, turkey wings, and sweet tongue feeders. 
Eventually, he saw the last remains of the pie, took a big swing on of the homemade nettle champagne, burped around his stomach contentedly. That's better. Toothless can hear now. Who's you say? Will you get that key from Norbert the not just pocket before the he murders the lot of us? His hiccup at the pool at the top of his whisper. So say pretty net place, say so less pretty place. Whispered hiccup through gritted teeth. Oh okay, keep your hair on," said Toothless, and he took off rather wobbly because he had eaten so much and crushed land on Norbert's the nut drop's chest. Luckily, Norbert was so that to the world, he merely grunted and hugged his axe a little closer. Giggling, Toothless sniffed off both of Norbert the nut drop's fancy mustache with two bits of his sharp little gums, and then he stepped into Norbert's pocket and pulled out the key. Toothless marched across the banqueting table with the key in his mouth, spitting it out every now and then to make pr- pointed remarks to Hiccup. It's typical, snorted Toothless. T- typical. Poor old starving to Toothless, woken up from his hibernation nap just to save the day yet again. Toothless put the key back in his mouth, and this time his large, overfull belly prevented him from seeing exactly where he was putting his feet, and he tripped over a knife lying in his middle of in the middle of the table. Tusa lurched to forest, knocking a candle off the table and on the floor where it promptly set fire off a polar bear rock. He did a couple of somersaults, spinning over and over until he landed bottom first in the well bore steel and swallowed the key. G-g-gulp, said Tuzlas.